The feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3. Coming up this afternoon, more problems for Angela Rayner. Police investigate multiple allegations about Labour's deputy leader with at least 12 officers on the job. Meanwhile, calls to ban smacking. Doctors want parents to be barred from smacking their kids in England and Northern Ireland. And a downpour in Dubai. Brits in the UAE take shelter amidst the worst rainfall in 75 years. We'll be speaking to someone about their experience later. All of that is coming up. But first, let's get to the news headlines with Divya Kohli. Good afternoon. David Cameron is in Israel in an attempt to limit Benjamin Netanyahu's actions in retaliation against Iran. The Foreign Secretary has joined calls by the US and the EU to place restrictions on Iran, but is urging Israel not to retaliate with force after this weekend's drone and missile strikes. Rishi Sunak echoed Lord Cameron's thoughts in a phone call with the Israeli Prime Minister. We also discussed the situation and how Iran is isolated on the world stage. Uh, and also I made the point to him that significant escalation is not in anyone's interest and it's a time for calm heads to prevail. I also reiterated our concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. The Prime Minister's plan to phase out smoking is one step closer to coming into law. Despite some opposition, the proposals to ban smoking among youngsters passed its first hurdle in the Commons last night. The regulations will raise the legal age each year in a bid to phase out the habit, as well as restrict the sales of vapes. On the street, there's been mixed reaction. Yeah, it's good because kids can't smoke then, can they? But people do get people to go to the shop, don't they, to buy them, so it's not really going to stop anyone, is it? And I personally think cigarettes can't be banned. People will go mad. I think it does set a good example. I think it's good. It prevents a lot of younger people from smoking in the future. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years as cost of living pressures continue to ease. Inflation fell from 3.4 to 3.2 percent in March, meaning what we pay for goods and services is rising at a slower rate. The Office for National Statistics says food prices was one of the major contributing factors. Post Office boss Nick Reid has been cleared of bullying claims. In a statement, the Post Office said Mr Reid has been exonerated of all misconduct allegations following an independent review and would continue to lead the organisation. Concerns over the chief executive's behaviour were made public after former chairman Henry Staunton raised them to a select committee looking at the Horizon IT scandal. Labour says Angela Rayner is happy to provide police with whatever information they need as she continues to be investigated. The Times are reporting officers are examining multiple allegations, including tax matters, and if Ms Rayner gave false information to the Electoral Register. Labour Shadow Education Minister Catherine McKinnell says the Labour deputy leader is fully cooperating with authorities. She has said very clearly she is happy to provide all of that information to the relevant authorities, HMRC, to the police. In fact, she welcomes it because she wants to draw a line under this situation. And people are being advised to stay away from Dubai Airport after the city was hit by the heaviest rainfall in 75 years. Check-in remains suspended for all Emirates flights today in the wake of the UAE being battered by torrential rain. Homes, cars, roads and runways were all inundated as five and a half inches fell in 24 hours yesterday, the equivalent of a year and a half of rain for the desert state. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffa.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's still looking rather blustery out there for today and there will be some showers, particularly across eastern areas of the UK. As we see an area of low pressure slide its way southwards along the east coast, bringing some heavy and thundery showers. There's also an area of cloud and rain moving its way southwards from Northern Ireland, the Republic, to the far west of Wales and southwest England by the end of this afternoon. Everywhere else, there'll be some bright or sunny spells, but there's also going to be quite a few showers, as I mentioned, especially across the central and eastern areas of the UK, some of which will be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail and it's feeling cool with the northerly winds and the briskness of those winds as well temperatures only up to around 10 degrees celsius now overnight the showers will fade away southwards as will the rain across the southwest and it will be largely dry and clear winds will become lighter as well so it's going to be quite a chilly night and in rural spots there could be frosty conditions by dawn there will be cloud and rain from the next low moving to the northwest of the uk and that will continue to move its way southwards across scotland and northern ireland through tomorrow morning and then later Later, towards the north of England and Wales, there will be cloudier skies and patchy rain. Further south, though, looks mostly fine and bright and feeling milder with the lighter winds in the sunshine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next two hours, including plans to use RAF planes to send migrants to Rwanda. Today we're joined in the studio by Talk TV's fabulous international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, well, uh, one of the big stories of the day uh, is smacking kids. Uh, the doctors are urging the government to bring in more laws to tell us what we can and cannot do. Uh, and this time, uh, the government uh, is being urged to take the role of parents and uh, to ban mums and dads from smacking their kids. Now, I don't think you should smack your kids uh, as a rule. Uh, I, was, I was saying earlier that when I, I'm so old, when I was a kid, I was smacked every day by a whole range of adults. My mum, my dad, <laughs> the local copper. And look how you teacher, turn out. Teacher, There's an advert right now for corporal punishment. You know, didn't do me any harm. No, seriously, I mean, of course you shouldn't smack your kids. But now and again, there must be moments where parents must be allowed to make that decision. For example, if your kid is running towards a busy motorway, don't do that. Tap across the back of the legs or something like that. Um, this legislation was actually brought in absolutely ages ago in Scotland because it was one of the first stories I, I covered as a political journalist under the new Scottish Parliament and they banned smacking. Um, so it is something that at that time I gave some thought to not as a parent. I now have three children, they're far too old for smacking now. Um, Look, it's not a popular cause to say let parents happily smack away their kids. Well, of course not. Um, but please, can the state just butt out of yes. our... Uh, yes. I don't want the long arm of government and its long beady eyes looking into my home and telling what me, what I can do as a mother to discipline my children when necessary. Um, you just asked me before we came on air, did I, have I smacked my children? And I would say I can count the times probably on the fingers of one hand, and that's three children. So the answer to that is barely, but every parent needs that ability not to be criminalised for incredibly rarely giving a child a light tap because either there's a real danger mm -hmm. or, frankly, it's the only thing that's going to work in that moment. And no-one ever feels good about it, I mean, this is but it thing. does work. We've got legislation that criminalises the abuse of children, actually injuring, hurting children. That exists. They are protected by law. And I think what this legislation does that doctors are suggesting the government introduce is it just encourages snitching. Because, you know, if you've got a child who's you know, running towards the pan of fat on the stove and yeah. you sort of grab them and move them out of the way and say, well, you, you know, you fool yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. um, the child's not going to be the one picking up the police. It'll be, what, your neighbour who saw you through the net curtains? It'll be, you know, Auntie Mildred who was over for a cup of tea, but in her nose I mean, you again. say that the child isn't going to cause, call the police, but you would probably be amazed at how empowered children are mm. now. And there may be an argument that that's a good thing, mm. but you make no mistake young children know their parents aren't supposed to do certain things mm -hmm. again that is a good thing wait till they say to the teacher oh you know mum smacked me for that and before you know it busy body teachers onto social right. services
says, look, just just butt out. Yeah. We don't need this. The government has so many problems to be yeah. getting on with. Right. It does not need to be interfering. Yeah, it in goes this like way. this. I mean, it, this is sort of sort of paternalism, and it's uh, it's uh, two bit politicians looking for their legacies. Uh, Rishi, your legacy will be no in uh, fifty years' time. No one will remember you at all. Whatever you do, it's the same for nearly all politicians. They just fade <laughs> into obscurity. Yeah, the obscurity. Like a surname and a date. Yeah, the obscurity for game. which they were designed. So uh, they can't seem to sort out the things that we want sorted out, like uh, our borders, like yeah. the economy, like law and order, and uh, like this nonsense yeah. wokery, the insanity of uh, trans issues in schools. They don't seem to be able to do anything about that. So mm. Rishi says, I know, I'll ban smoking. And now next they'll go, I'm the one who bans uh, smacking kids. You know, Cameron goes around going, oh, I'm the one who brought in gay marriage. Yeah, well, no one remembers, Dave. I mean, this is the problem. It's politicians who can't get to grips with the real problems of this society coming up with other problems and saying that will be my legacy because they're big heads and they don't realise there'll be no legacy for Well, them. at the moment, Rishi Sunak's only legacy is one of total disaster. You know, he was up, <laughs> yes. until, up until fairly recently, he was very proud of the fur furlough scheme during COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'm afraid history has had to be rewritten on that one. And we now know the appalling, toxic legacy that that has left, mm. which is a culture of worklessness. Yes. Mm. And in towns like places like Blackpool, 25% unemployment. A lot of people there feel that it's not worth right. them trying to get a job. And there are very few opportunities anyway, because the welfare state is paying them so yeah, much. That's, a, that's an as much vaunted fiscal headroom, which you also managed to take out in the process. Yeah, they're, they're, they're such egotists, these people. It's like, really, Rishi, honestly, no one will remember you. They just won't. I mean, think of all those politicians. You see these politicians on the telly, you think, oh, they're the most famous people in Britain. Then they lose their jobs. A year later, no one could even name them or spot them in I a mean, crowd. I mean, you say a year later, I would hazard a guess that there is a significant number of people in this yeah. country today that would struggle to name Rishi Sunak. Yeah, well, quite, quite. Uh, anyway, that is our big question uh, to you, our wonderful audience today. We are asking you, uh, should smacking your children be made illegal? Give us a call, let us know what you think, 03444991000, or you can text us, uh, write talk at the beginning of your message, send it to 87222, or you can tweet us on x at talk TV. To our top story now, and police are investigating multiple allegations against Angela Rayner, possibly extending beyond electoral law offences. At least a dozen officers at Greater Manchester Police are investigating the Labour deputy leader over the sale of her former council house in Stockport and her tax affairs. The investigation is expected to take weeks rather than days. Grilled at Prime Minister's questions today, Sir Keir Starmer continued to back his deputy a bit, uh, following <laughs> jibes from Rishi Sunak. Mr Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a, bit, and, a bit more, and a bit more time reading the Deputy Leader's tax advice. We've got a billionaire Prime Minister and a billionaire Prime Minister, both of, both of whose families have used schemes to avoid millions of pounds of tax smearing a working-class woman. Smearing a working-class woman? What a terrible thing to do! Angela Rayner has denied any wrongdoing, insisting she followed the rules at all times. Uh, joining us now is former government advisor James Price, uh, and Isabel Oakshot is still with us. So let's go to you first, James. Uh, w w when did the newspapers forget that uh, her tax affairs were always being investigated? That was, a, that was the main thrust of the story when it broke about three about a month ago, which was uh, she was being investigated for, for potential evasion of capital gains tax uh, for allegedly lying about where she was living. And also, of course, if you lied about where you were living, you are potentially breaking electoral law as well. That was almost an addendment. Uh, why have the papers forgotten the tax affairs? Go, also, now she's being investigated for her tax affairs. She always was. Well, the, the, the problem here you've got is that the tax affairs are by their nature very complicated and therefore complicated gets quite boring. Um, that's why sex scandals sell newspapers so much better because it's easy and everybody kind of can get their head around it. And um, the thing that's really interested me is that when it's, it's Rishi Sunak or my old boss or any of these other kind of problems come along, oh, it must be very terrible. The Tories are all very evil because the numbers of money is higher and all this kind of stuff. But as you just saw there, Keir Starmer's defence is, well, she's a working class woman. You can't smear her. <laughs> so we've managed to get this kind of bizarre identity politics, even into the areas of criminality. 
as if someone being from uh, one class or another or being one sex or another or something else is enough of a reason that she shouldn't let face scrutiny. Right, this kind of soft bigotry of low expectations, as it used to be called, holds everybody back. It does all of us a mad disservice. And and the, the saddest thing for me is that when it's it's my old boss because he was successful and managed to you know lead the, the world's best vaccine rollout and all these sorts of things, he was an easy target. But when it's Angela Rayner, whose main contribution seems to be shouting the word scum at her opponents across the House of Commons, she needs to be given a break and held to a lower standard. I don't understand it at all. I wonder how useful this is to the Conservative Party, though. I mean, when you see things suddenly reappear in newspapers, you often wonder if a press office has had their hand in that. And quite convenient, it gave Rishi Sunak another opportunity to bring it up at PMQs and potentially try and deflect away from more embarrassing things he may be questioned on. Um, but, you know, it, it, the Labour response is very predictable. And I kind of feel it's one of those issues that, depending who you vote for, who you're minded to vote for, you're either going to support the Labour response and say, well, it's all very well, the Conservative Conservatives saying this about Rayner, but look at some of their tax avoidance. Or you're going to support the Conservatives and say, well, I remember the time when Angela Rayner was champing up the bit to do down Boris Johnson for eating a piece of cake. I'm not sure actually it edifies either side. No, absolutely not. No, there are no winners from any of this. That we used to be since what the, the the Profumo scandal of the 1960s, we realised that politicians were were human as well, and they were flawed, and that it was such a, a scandal that we couldn't not report on it. Everybody now is aware that politicians, just like everybody else, maybe more than everybody else, have their own failings. The blue team has failings. The red team has failings. Goodness knows, you know, the yellow team up north of the border have their failings as well. And everybody sort of says, as you say rightly, Alex, a, a, a pox on all their houses. I think that's a real problem. I think we've either got to have a scenario where everybody must continue to be whiter than white, must be beyond reproach, and the, you know, the paragons of, of justice, which we know is impossible, or we go, okay, look, everyone's going to mess up on these things. Give a, a scenario, a world in which they can say, yes, I messed up. Let me go and have a look at this. I didn't understand the taxes right. Let me go and try and fix it. I have a second chance, have that kind of Christian idea of grace or forgiveness, and then see what else they can actually contribute to, to public life. Because we're losing far too many people in, in, in some scandals and things that I think that shouldn't be career ending. Some, of course, should. But we lose really high quality people. And of course, when you see all this kind of scrutiny of people one way or another, if you've got really talented people out there who've been successful, who may not have a perfect blame free record, uh, they are stopping from getting involved in public life in the first place. Can you imagine what would have happened if Churchill had never reared his head again after Gallipoli? We wouldn't have had the greatest leader that helped us fight against the Nazis and all the rest of it. And there are numerous other examples. But this is the thing that really concerns me. Where do we have forgiveness or grace in public life today? Well, uh, th but this is uh, th this is comes down to did the deputy leader of the Labour Party break the law or did she not? She says she doesn't. She didn't, and she says she has a letter from a tax expert uh, which will exonerate her. Of course, uh, we're all saying, well, show it to us. She goes, I'm yeah, not exactly. going to show you my personal tax returns. We're not asking for your personal tax returns. We're asking for that letter. Although it is Labour Party that, that, to publish them. That, well, it isn't. <laughs> it, it, not, not for the deputy leader. It isn't for the deputy leader. So uh, she doesn't have to, in any, according to Labour policy. The point is, uh, 12 officers, at least 12 Manchester co detectives, are now investigating her. Uh, and if it turns out that she lied about uh, her capital gains and where she was living, as I say, the electoral uh, fraud is, I think, a lesser charge. But if it turns out that she evaded taxes illegally, uh, then she deserves everything she's going to get. She can't carry on uh, as deputy uh, Labour leader. She says she's going to stand down. It's as simple as that. It's nothing to do with her being working class or, you know, Ange and all that. It is, did she break the law or did she not? And now she's got 12 Manchester coppers on her backside and she won't like it. No, absolutely right. And, and again, there is this kind of hypocrisy about it. The number of people who Angela Rayner has called on to resign for non-criminal acts, when this, if this is a criminal investigation now happening to her, that's pretty pretty serious going. Um, it does, as, as Alex has said as well, it just brings everybody down into the mud on these kinds of things. Um, you know, people like to, to sow and they don't like to reap very much. The, the concern for the, the Conservatives, in a way almost, is why do you want to lose this person from the front bench who is actually really unpopular, I think, on the doorstep? Every doorstep I've ever knocked on when I've been a Conservative activist, she tends to come up and not in a great way. And, and for many people in the sort of the BBC and the sort of well-to-do Islington media sets, go oh, look at this gritty, authentic, working-class <laughs> woman and all the rest of it. But people like my, my parents who didn't go to university, who've worked hard all their lives, 
they look at something like this says what and she's just worked for a trade union and got given a safe labor seat and has done nothing <laughs> really much significance before this isn't a kind of person to represent me and this is a sort of she's almost a weird parody of, of working class people i mean i know i sound a bit plummy now but but <laughs> this is not the, the kind of world that i grew up in when alex and i were growing up in gloucester you know, people work really really hard and they do their best they don't try and fiddle their the house they live in with their partner and all these kinds of things uh, i think that, that that problem and also the fact that her and keir starmer clearly don't get on with each other you know, the conservatives are pushing this I completely understand it. But you almost want to keep her in post to help destabilise the Labour Party even more. Uh, James, yeah. thank you very much. You've never mentioned that you two come from Gloucester before. We never before. bring that up, do we, never, never It's contractually up. obligated. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, James. Great Cheers, stuff. James. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, do you know, guys. it's interesting, talking about Gloucester, and talk, he mentioned about police investigations and all parties and north of the border. And I often wonder what happened after the Fred West tent on um, <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon's front garden. Where are we going the, with it? And this? the sort of criminal <laughs> camper van. No, but there's a police <laughs> investigation. Do you remember they started digging up her garden? That was extraordinary. Like, I think they, yeah. I think they didn't find find any bodies. Yeah, I think you can no. probably conclude that. Um, I thought Investigation his, continues. I but. thought his analysis was really interesting. Um, I am probably one of those people that fell in the category of thinking Angela Rayner is actually a great thing for the Labour Party. And I still think that pure, purely, really, primarily, because she provides a real bit of colour where it's desperately needed. I mean, Keir Starmer, nice though he may be, has got to be one of the most boring political leaders I have ever come across. And mm. what Ange does is bring a bit of fire uh, to the table there. And I think that's needed. People don't want to vote for boring, do they? Yeah, they so yeah. I think she, she is extraordinarily interesting and charismatic. And I think she's got tremendous spirit. I'm actually a fan of Angela Rayner. Um, and I also don't think it's at all proportionate to have 12 police officers digging around on this. It is patently absurd to have that many police officers investigating such a small matter. Frankly, if she's done something wrong and she knows she has, she should just resign. She should have done so ages ago and she could have been brought back before the election. I'll tell, yeah, I'll tell you the right really useful that. function that Angela uh, Rayner fulfills in the Labour Party. It gives mm. the other Labour MPs the chance to meet somebody who's genuinely working class. I know, right? They don't often yeah, come true. across. But yeah, someone who's yeah. not actually from Islington or Hampstead. So yeah. for that reason, uh, she's a good thing. And that's why, of course, the Tories are making so much of it, while all her political enemies are making so much of it, because she's a, a huge beast in the Labour movement. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and as you say, I think she'd be a much better leader than Starmer. So if Ooh, if she leader. has... To, if she ha Oh, yeah, 100%. I, if she I has agree, to, actually. Of I course mean, she would. Uh, yeah, she's I, she's charismatic. Is, I know, and I she's not... She could lead she's, anything. Of course she Maybe could. a conger in Butlins. No, but rubbish. She, she, could, she could be the leader. Party. It's dead easy to be the Labour leader of the Labour Party. Corbyn did it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if they lose her... Uh, it'll be a massive loss. It will be a massive loss, which is clearly why Keir Starmer has held on to her all this time, even though they don't actually get on that mm. well. You know, he recognises that she is a huge asset, um, ticking a lot of boxes that he and some of his other very dreary colleagues don't. Um, and thinking about what happens if she goes, who replaces Angela mm. Rayner? I think that's really difficult. There is no other Angela Rayner. She's, you know, she is quite unique. Um, yeah. What's oh, the one um, that they could... Uh, Bridget Phillipson is the Bridget name that's floating to about you. I couldn't pick her out of a but, By the way, about no, what the point you... No, I know. <laughs> what does she just, even we look just, like? They, we just had looked up her picture. I still no. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the point you just made about the police, I agree with that. They are, they're overcompensating because, because they have serious questions to answer because when it was first taken to them, this case of her yeah. alleged capital gains uh, avoidance evasion... Uh, they said, no, no criminal, nothing to see here. Uh, a Tory MP, whose name escapes me, uh, took it back to the police. Uh, and the police had to say, well, yes, maybe there is something to investigate here. So now uh, they're, but they're droning on about the public interest and all that. But they're overcompensating for what looks like an uh, original mistake. Completely. I mean, I would have said one to two people yeah, would be quite plenty to mm. investigate this and they should have a clear time frame. It's called a couple of weeks mm. crack on. Yeah, James yeah. Daly was the Tory MP who took it back to the police. Uh, so Hi. there you are. Stay with us, Isabel. Coming up after the break, Sunak's smoking bill makes it through the Commons, but nearly half of Conservative MPs voted against it or abstained. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk from Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, uh, the controversial smoking ban made it through the House of Commons last night, but it was hardly a victory for the Prime Minister. The yeah, almost right. half of Tory MPs failed to support the bill, which would ban anyone born after 2008 from ever buying cigarettes. A total of 165 Conservatives either abstained or voted against the government. Uh, well, we're we're still joined in the studio by Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. But before we go on, I believe I owe you, Alex, an apology and the audience. I got, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'd always assumed that I'm right about everything, but it turns <laughs> out I'm not. Go on, put me straight. Yeah, no, because I said to you, it's Labour Party policy that the, the, the top ponchos in the Labour Party publish their tax returns. Keir Starmer did actually make this announcement a year ago and said that the top three in the Labour Party, that includes Angela Rayner, yeah. should have to publish their tax returns, something he seems to have U-turned on, and I think quite an interesting element to the whole furore over... It really is, case. it really is, I, because yeah. I thought it was an agreement between Sunak and Starmer oh, that no. just the party leaders would do so, but uh, I was wrong, yeah. and uh, you were right to point that out. It's a very well, important I'm element. Well, often left, is all I can say. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for damn sure. Uh, so, uh, smoking, uh, the smoking yeah. ban. More nanny statism, Isabel, uh, just sticking out their noses into our lives. Paternalism, uh, it's bad for you, therefore we will make it illegal. Mm. What else are they going to make I, illegal because it's bad I'm for us? I'm going to surprise you on this one. I... I'm quite in favour of banning cigarettes. And so I've got to be consistent about this because otherwise plenty of people dig up clips of me saying I'm in favour of banning smoking. Um, 
Is it going to work? I do. I, I tell you what, my main problem with this proposal is I don't actually understand it. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> there is that. The I, I, it, it, makes, it makes me feel stupid. What I, I don't get it. So someone at one age can buy them in the future and yet another right. adult so can't. If you're I mean, born on a certain date, then you can buy cigarettes for the rest of your life. If you're born a day later, you can never buy cigarettes for that, the rest of your life. I don't so get that. Are there going to be people walking up and down the streets with people standing outside pubs having a Marlboro saying, can I just check your birth certificate, please? Yeah, exactly. yeah probably. Like, it's really yeah. weird. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. I yeah, mean, I think our smoking legislation, uh, certain things we've done on this, banning smoking in public places has been a really good thing. And I still find it weird going to countries in, mm. including in the middle east where people are just smoking in restaurants you know and that yeah. is so archaic now and when we brought in the ban on smoking in public places everyone said this is never going to work we're never going to be able to police it people will just ignore it and actually it has worked it does work and it makes going out a much more pleasant okay thing. well how about the government uh, we're gonna have a listen to list trust trust uh, in this mm. debate in just a second but how about the government has the courage rishi has the courage of his convictions and makes smoking illegal yeah, i'll tell you I why he won't that. do that because yeah, so he makes I, I he makes 10 that. billion quid a year yeah. on tobacco duties so uh hypocrisy at work there uh, let's have a listen to liz trust uh putting in her thoughts on this debate yesterday in the commons but the problem is the instinct of this establishment, and which is reflected by a cross-party consensus today in today's chamber, is to believe that they, that the government, are better at making decisions for people than people themselves. And I absolutely agree that that is true for the under-18s. It is very important, until people have decision-making capability while they are growing up, that we protect them. But I think the whole idea that we can protect adults from themselves is hugely problematic. Yeah, what I think is really funny about this legislation, and I'm kind of with you on this, I've always said, why just, just ban smoking outright? If you want to get rid of smoking, just ban it outright. You know, have the courage of your convictions. Yes. But what I think is funny is the sort of, it loops in everything, vaping, it loops in cigars. It's sort of like, let's not just stop at cigarettes. Let's go for the whole, you know, caboodle. And I kind of think, why? Why? I mean, vaping, I know it's sort of still untested, but every single report I've ever seen on it is supposed to be 95% safer than smoking. Oh, I think there's a plenty of evidence emerging that it's a pretty bad thing to do. I mean, it's just logic, isn't it? You know, endlessly puffing some kind of chemical into your lungs probably isn't going to ultimately be that good an idea. Doctors don't recommend it, yeah. I mean, the best thing here, really, is education. And I, I have attempted, really? I really hope successfully, to completely brainwash my children about the evils of smoking to such an extent that it can be almost embarrassing taking them down the street because they are liable to have some kind of outburst when they see someone you know puffing away on what they would call cancer sticks so you know if parents can just educate their children about the downsides of this you know particularly in terms of sport fitness push the right buttons you know yeah. young girls don't want horrible yellow teeth they don't want wrinkles all around their mouth so find ways to deter children which aren't about a ban that they'll find ways to breach but loads well, of kids are not taking up smoking now anyway it's sort of really well, it's in the decline it's yeah. they do love them but I, you know I, i'm very much uh, really uh, vehemently against this uh, rishi's smoking ban uh but uh partly I, I think it won't work but also i mean this is just statism isn't it, it uh, is and, and this and there will, i agree with and you. this will herald uh, an era of prohibition it'll be alcohol next then gambling they're already the government is already proposing uh to be able to look at the finances yeah. of people to see how much they spend yeah. on gambling and if it's more than 500 yeah. pounds a year they want to get involved leave us alone just leave us alone it's unbelievable no i, I agree with you about that and some of the measures on gambling have already had a pretty devastating impact mm. on certain sports and i think the horse racing industry is suffering quite heavily um, as a result of well-meaning but frankly misguided um, legislation and, and regulation. Um, uh, you are slightly left thinking, why do they keep coming after our fun? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. We said let us yesterday. do a bit of gambling, yeah. let us have a drink and, you know, I suppose um, grown-ups, well-informed, if, if they really feel the need to smoke, then maybe they should be. It's like, it's like the government, or 
people like Suna effectively are saying, if it's bad for you, I'm going to make it illegal. Mm. Well... Do one, Sunak, because I do a lot... Is she Sunak? I do lots of things. bad for us. Let's ban him. I do way too many things that are very, very bad for We'd me. We'd never have and, guessed. <laughs> and that is a question of personal liberty, and it really scares me that the government... The reach of the government is growing by the day. So what Pro about a fat tax? I take it you're against, against that fat 100%. Tax. Do you want people what? to just be able to get more and more enormous? Yeah, if, if I want to eat uh, <laughs> chips... Yeah, look at me. Uh, if I want to eat chips and drink beer and smoke cigarettes, that's my business. And if it costs the NHS a lot of money, I don't care. <laughs> well, on that note, because we've got to change topics and move swiftly along to our next one, the RAF to run Rwanda flights. Rishi Sunak is now planning to deploy RAF Voyager aircraft to deport migrants to Rwanda after the Home Office failed to find an airline that would actually agree to do it. Everyone oh, they approached no said, surprise. no thanks. Yeah. Although, I don't... I, I kind of expected these people to be mass-deported via some military aircraft. I thought think that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm not imagining them being on sort of Virgin Atlantic or yeah, something. Yeah, sipping or, on their know, tomato Emirates. juice. Yeah. Easy jet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, like you, I assumed that it would be, you know, it would be the military that organised this if it ever happens, which is still yeah. a very big if. I think it's possible that we'll see one flight take off. There'll be ludicrous demonstrations and there'll be about two people on board, you know, and yeah. a load of weeping lefties, you know, bowing down on the runway and um, generally <laughs> acting yeah. as if the sky's well, about to fall in. Well, at least if it's a military aircraft taken off from a military mm. air base, it'll make it hard for the weeping lefties to glue themselves to well, the you, tarmac. You, but you forget the Royal Navy refused to turn uh, migrant boats around in the middle of the channel on health and safety grounds and all that. So, no doubt, if uh, the government says to the RAF, you've got to fly the migrants to Rwanda, the RAF will come up with some reason that they, they don't want to do it. Well, I'd like to think the RAF is a, a little bit more robust than that. Um, and if they're not, there'll be serious questions to ask. And uh, talking about defence, I've just pa walked past, just before coming here, I've just walked past the Ministry of Defence on uh, Whitehall. I know what you're going to say. You know what I'm going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is, in red paint. I saw your tweet. There is red paint yeah. still Why is it not all off? over that building. And I walked past an yeah. army of people yeah. not going into the MOD to look after the defence of the realm but actually using taxpayers' resources to have to clean off that mess, which is mm. criminal vandalism. Yep. And, and you know who did it? Is, it is high time. Of course, it was a pro-Palestinian... Yeah, but it was um, an amalgam of Just Stop Oil and pro-Palestinian, well, but it was the, the youth division. It was the youth division. It is division. time these people are made to pay each and every penny back mm. of what this costs. And yep. it will be thousands of pounds, and they will be having to work really hard for a very long period to pay off that debt. And I bet you, if that became the routine situation if yeah. you cause that kind of damage you are literally going to pay for it then i bet you there'd be an awful lot yeah, less of them down, doing it i walked down whitehall the other day and i had exactly the same feeling of you i was repulsed and embarrassed it's the fact that this beautiful big yeah. building right next to the river thames which we know is our uh, military of defense with all the sort of war memorials outside is covered on with vandalism why should, why should taxpayers pay for this beautiful building completely empty no workers inside they're all working from home uh let's talk about uh this uh, right wing political it's conference mad. in uh, Brussels, shall we? You take it away. Yeah, it's so bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers. The National Conservatism Conference, which is basically a coming together of all sorts of characters. Some politicians, Suella Braverman was speaking, Miriam Cates, a Conservative MP, Nigel Farage, of course, second day today, supposed to be Victor Orban, the, the leader of Hungary. Um, and then other think tankers, the pollster Matthew Goodwin, just characters who believe in, I don't know, common sense politics, all coming together in Brussels to have a bit of a jamboree. But of course, the leftist mayor of uh, saint jos Nude in Brussels, which is where the event was going to be held, decided he didn't want this to happen. So in he marched his police with court orders saying there'll be a real uh, risk of there being public disturbance. You might say hurty words that someone in Belgium is going to get upset about. So this event has to be closed down. That, dear reader, is the actual definition of fascism. Yeah. I found the scenes that came out of that yesterday absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, look, we've had our ups and downs with Brexit and how it's been delivered. But as Nigel Farage said yesterday, if ever there was a moment you were glad not to be part of this charade, <laughs> it is that spectacle of police being brought in to disperse a peaceful conference of perfectly mainstream yeah. right-leaning mm -hmm. ideas. We're not talking some kind of 
Nazi youth convention with everybody goose stepping and yeah. swathed in swastikas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are serious people. Some of them are democratically elected. Uh, they are not proposing anything that is hateful or no. um, appalling in any in way. In fact, the promotion was of family and values and protecting culture, all the nice things that uh, those on the left clearly want to destroy. And let's not forget, it really bothers me, and people always uh, equate right-wingery to Nazism, when they were socialists! Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, that, uh, the police, sending the police into a political conference to disperse it on the grounds uh, that uh, they may say hurty words, that's like what the Nazis that's exactly what uh, let's have a listen to one of the people who attended that uh, event was uh, your very own Nigel Farage. We just mentioned him. Uh, Going to be seeing him tonight, actually. But uh, right now, he has a few words to say about what happened in Brussels. You know, I've, I've experienced council culture personally here. I've had, you know, restaurants wouldn't serve me in Brussels in my last days as an MEP, coffee bars. Even the pub I used to use said I couldn't go there anymore. Um, but what's happened here is now on the stage of where there is global media, we can see that, 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 that legally held opinions from people who are going to win national elections is no longer acceptable here in Brussels, the home of globalism. Yeah, I mean, the mask is really starting to slip. When you look at uh, Donald Tusk, who, of course, used to be the head of the uh, European Council, banning all sorts of media now. He's the Prime Minister of Poland. I think those who are sort of very connected to the Euro Club are beginning to be exposed for what they really are. Mm. Yeah, well, well not before it, time. The head, yeah. Now, coming up after the break, a deluge in Dubai. We'll speak to one resident after 18 months' worth of rain fell in just one day. What's going on there? I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we were supposed it to was another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, it's day three of the Trump hush money trial, and the judge has already accused the former president of intimidation. The New York judge scolded Donald Trump after he was caught muttering to a Ooh. potential juror. And this is what yeah. Trump had to say about the judge after leaving the courtroom yesterday. There shouldn't be a gag order, let me just tell you. The gag order is totally unconstitutional. The judge should not be there. The judge is highly conflicted. He should not be there. Uh, well, we're still joined in the studio by Talk TV's international editor, Isabel Oakshot. Well, uh, Donald Trump, by the way, I like his new haircut. It's a little less extravagant. Oh, I was thinking it looked a bit weirder than I before. Like <laughs> I think he looks slightly more human. Don't you uh, like his style even better, though? I mean, imagine having the guts to go outside and just, know, just lay into the actual the yeah. judge in your yeah. actual case. Yeah, I mean, who does that? Ridiculous. Completely well, ignoring yeah. the gag order. Yeah. Uh, so the judge says every day, oh, no, you can't say that and you can't campaign. Did anyone? He's campaigning every day and he's going straight outside and disobeying the gag order. So Donald Trump, uh, is. this is an eight-week trial. He's making it work for him already, isn't he? Yeah, he really is. And every time he has these confrontations, you know, it reinforces his face. A few, anyone who's wavering can't imagine that there are many potential Trump voters mm. who are sort of on the fence at this point. Uh, but each time he recruits more. The problem I have with this whole uh, Ferrari and this nonsense, because that's what it is, it is a farce. You know, here we are discussing Angela Rayner's tax affairs and then it's similar sort of nonsense going on over there. But this is really serious because this guy is potentially going to be the next president of the United States. We're at a time where we're at the brink of global conflict. If we're not already in a sort of cold to warm, tepid war uh, already with the enemies of the West. And instead, all of America's energies are being taken up by this performance. Well, also, I think that Donald Trump's actual record on foreign policy is really underrated. You I know, the, the, the lefty lobbies cannot bear to give him any credit mm. for anything. But the reality is that his, in, in a number of respects, his foreign policy was actually quite Incredible. a success. Yeah. I mean, look at the Abraham Accords, uh, look at his robust position on Chinese aggression. Mm. And I think when he argues uh, that a lot of the awful things that have happened in the last few weeks would not have happened were he president, I think right. there's a real... Well, truth truth to I, I think actually the fact that you had Arab nations all coming together and helping the West to intercept those missiles raining yeah. down from Tehran is a direct uh, result of his incredible foreign policy because it was Donald Trump who brought them in and normalised relations yes. with Saudi and Israel and the UAE. That's yeah. what Iran didn't like. And guess what? As soon as Iran tried to break up the fun, yeah. it didn't work. Also, he's unpredictable. And That's the uh, point. So you just don't know. So things. yes, maybe he would have done nothing. Maybe he he could have taken one position. He could have taken another. Mm. But that, in a sense, is the genius of it. You yeah. never quite know. Yeah. He could literally go ballistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And that's what that's what people fear about Iran. They fear about Putin. All, all of our enemies. What yeah. we fear most is their what they unpredi do. unpredictability. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah, will yeah, they yeah, do? The and Trump thing. brings that to the table for the yeah. West. He absolutely does. And you know, the more the um, left-leaning and left-wing establishment get themselves into a whole lather about how dreadful it is, the prospect of Trump coming back and how awful he is, the more I'm keen on the whole thing. I don't care if he had slept with every single female entertainer in the adult industry. That's, you know, whatever. Let, let his wife worry about that. Just give us a he president denies, who's going to stand up for Western security. He denies, he denies having sex with uh, Stormy Daniels, calls her horse face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he does. Important, uh, that's a very unfair to debate. poor Stormy, I think you'll agree. Uh, now, uh, we've been talking about the Dubai deluge. Uh, let's speak yeah. to someone in Dubai, an old friend of mine, Anil Boyle, a uh, journalist uh, at uh, Arabian Business. <laughs> Business magazine. Hi, Anil. Uh, hey, Kevin. How are you doing? Uh, tell us all about the last few days. Uh, quite a deluge. Have seen anything? You've been out there what now? Twenty years? Seen anything like that? Yeah, twenty years. Well, we had we had uh, eighteen months of rain fall in twenty four hours. Actually, in two hours. It was all yesterday three o'clock. It just came bucketing down. Skies went black. It was uh, it was a bit like an eclipse. Um, but you know, it was, a, it was a lot of water. Most people took eight hours to get home. Schools have been shut for three days now, or they will be shut for three days. Offices are closed. Most of the shops are closed. 
Um, you know, part of the problem you have in Dubai is that it's built for a hot country. You know, it's normally 40 degrees and very hot. So when it rains, the water kind of stays, as you can see in those pictures there, just stays on the road. It's got no um, drains, right, Daniel? Basically, no drains. And this, uh, sorry, my daughter's um, <laughs> having some fun behind us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, uh, no, no drains at all. Uh, the fact that you just saw my daughter, there's no school at all either. Right. Oh, so she's having a good time then. <laughs> now, one of the things that um, a sort of a relatively little known technology that has been going on for years, of course, is cloud seeding. And it's something I don't fully understand, but planes fly around and plant clouds in the sky in hot countries. And there's some speculation that perhaps they got a little bit trigger happy with the cloud seeding machine and put too much water up in the atmosphere. And that's why it all came down in 18 hours. Have you heard that? Well, I mean, that that's story goes around every year. Uh, I don't think it's quite true. I mean, the, what cloud seeding does is, you know, when there's already clouds, it just kind of just forces the rain a bit quicker. So, uh, you know, it would be a hell of a job to, to turn cloud seeding into the kind of storm that we saw yesterday. And, and also it should be noted that everybody's been talking about it for the last week that the storm was coming because they could see it coming from wherever else. So, so I don't think it was entirely cloud seeding. Uh, I think it's just the fact that, you know, countries like Dubai aren't used to having uh, this kind of rain, about, you know, it was it was 280, 280 millimeters of rain, which is what you'd get in London in five months, is what we got in, oh, in really three to four hours. Uh, so, you know, if that happened in London, you'd have the same, probably worse. I mean, I should say that was yesterday. Today, the sun is out. It's 28 degrees. Yeah. Um, everybody's about to head to the beach. Um, and we're all having, um, you know, two, three days off work. So, so, so you're, um, getting, you're getting over it now. But uh, the last <laughs> report we were, had was that the, the airport officials at Dubai Airport had asked people not to go there because it was so overcrowded uh, due to flights not being able to take off. Yeah, um, that was true. That was true. I think for about uh, a few hours, they suspended flights coming in and then some coming out. But that's not unusual. I mean, you know, you've, you've, you've seen that again in London in, in you know, peak summer and uh, when there have been floods or, or snow or whatever else. Uh, it, it, I guess the difference is because Dubai's in the desert. It's just such a big thing. You know, this kind of stuff doesn't happen. We, we never get this kind of extreme weather. We get extreme heat, which is about 45 degrees, but nobody seems to care. You know, there's AC everywhere and... Um, you know, we just gets on with it. So having this kind of extreme weather, I mean, I said it's 28 degrees outside right now. That's pretty cold for Dubai. I'm actually wearing this. It feels, it feels a bit, <laughs> feels a bit chilly for us. Yeah, it's about I mean, 28 this, degrees this below be zero yeah. here, uh, Anil. So <laughs> don't come back anytime soon. Uh, listen, Anil, great to Thank talk you. to you. Stay safe out there, eh? No, uh, Anil about, Boyle there. It's Thanks, about, mate. You're a regular visitor of Dubai and a big fan of it. And something yeah. you always say is, you yeah, look at this place in the desert. Everything and the works. whole time we haven't built HS2, yeah. they've built an entire city in the desert, a metropolis of all sorts of gadgets. One of that a cleanup's going to be done like that. It will be, and they will really not like these scenes going around the world and projecting any kind of impression that they're not on top of everything instantly. I mean, that Dubai airport is absolutely fantastic. It is so efficient. Everything works brilliantly. They will want that sorted in, a, in an absolute heartbeat, and I'm sure it will be. But there is no point in creating the infrastructure for deluges of rain that happen once yeah. every 70 years. You know, this isn't on any kind of par with the chaos that we have every time there's a tiny bit of snow. We <laughs> expect snow. Snow comes every year in the UK and still we can't handle it. Yeah. I think Dubai can be forgiven for not being ready for an historic once, probably in many people's lifetime, and who downpour. And that Tesla's floated? All these people Tesla's in their big floats. cars, you know, unable to drive them anywhere. Everyone with a Tesla a was like going about, about like a gondolier in Venice. They, they do have a lot of Teslas in Dubai. A lot of, I mean, all the Ubers. Uh, not all of them, but many of them are Teslas. You do slightly worry about the whole electrics and water thing. Mm. It may not be a great combo. So you see that right. story that the, the demand for electric vehicles globally is down 40%. I know. Uh, Elon Musk uh, is cutting 10% of his staff. So maybe he could just start selling, selling Teslas as boats. Tesla boats. So, you, know, it's, you know, a new direction for the company. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't be able to charge them though. I mean, I remember getting a, t a Tesla in a puddle and it won't charge at all. It's so right. yeah, I don't because water and electricity mm, they is... Don't really not, mix, a, do they? not a good thing. Listen, I remember we had someone on the show right at the beginning of uh, 
the, the nascent period of Kevin Alex. And he was basically an auto journalist saying that he thinks that electric cars are going to be like the CD and be around for about 15 years and then everyone will get over them and go well, back to the combustion people engine. People aren't buying them. But anyway. biofuels. People aren't buying them. But you see, the, oh, I think it was Hertz recently in America got rid of 20,000 of them because not only were people not buying them, they didn't want to hire them either. Yeah, yeah well, they're so, also just far too expensive, I think, still. You know, they, you can't get a nice, cheap, second-hand electric vehicle, mm. can you? If you did, where are you going to charge it? Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, there you are. Now, sticking with uh, motoring, uh, mm -hmm. apparently drivers are being handed ULES fines when they haven't committed any ULES offences. The cameras are wrongly identifying their cars. And in one case, an owner was sent a fine for non-payment for his Ford Mondeo, accompanied by a picture of a Nissan SUV. <laughs> oh, nice to see it all working out yeah. well. <laughs> Who would have thought it? Yeah, well, another triumph by uh, Sadiq Khan then. Yeah, no, indeed. Um, well, there you go. I think, well, all this... Why, why don't they just ban cars? Ban smoking, ban cars, ban enjoyment. Ban cycling. Definitely ban, ban cycling. cycling. Um, and, yeah, we're going to ban everything. Apart from this show. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ban <laughs> everything, and that will be my legacy. <laughs> Thank you, Emma, Thanks, so Isabel. It's always great, great having you. you on the programme. Now, coming up after the break, Labour's success in the local elections could be at risk as Greater Manchester Police reveals it's investigating multiple allegations against Angela Rayner. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV.
good afternoon. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you every weekday from 1 until 3 p.m. Now, coming up in this hour, more problems for Angela Rayner. Police are investigating multiple allegations into the Labour deputy leader with at least 12 officers on the job. The Foreign Secretary is in Israel. Lord Cameron says that Israel will strike back against Iran. And calls to ban smacking. Doctors want parents to be barred from smacking their kids in England and Northern Ireland. All that coming up. But first, let's get the news headlines. Via Coney. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has told Parliament he's spoken with Benjamin Netanyahu, calling for a time for calm heads. He also said escalation of tensions in the Middle East are in no one's interest. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron has echoed those thoughts as he visits Israel today. The US and the EU have called to place restrictions on Iran following this weekend's drone and missile strikes. Former Israeli Justice Minister Dr Yossi Belin told Talk TV the free world must unite against against Iran. I uh, don't see any reason to continue this uh, vicious uh, circle uh, with Iran, but it is an opportunity to think about what is happening with Iran. Uh, it's a rogue country and should be uh, related to uh, in that way. Angela Rayner's police investigation was also a hot topic at Prime Minister's questions today. The Times are reporting that at least a dozen officers are examining multiple allegations, including tax matters, as well as if Miss Rayner gave false information over where, whether she lived at the electoral register. The PM was eager to remind Keir Starmer about that when the Labour leader brought up Liz Truss's new book. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. <laughs> Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> well, Mr Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a bit, and a bit, more, and a bit more time reading the Deputy Leader's tax advice. <laughs> Former government adviser James Price told Talk TV it was wrong for Keir Starmer to then defend Ms Rayner by accusing the PM of smearing a working-class woman. Um, well, the thing that's really interested me is that when it's, it's Rishi Sunak or my old boss or any of these other kind of problems come along, oh, it must be very terrible, the Tories are all very evil because the numbers of money is higher and all this kind of stuff. But as you just saw there, Keir Starmer's defence is, well, she's a working-class woman, you can't smear her. <laughs> so we've managed to get this kind of bizarre identity politics, even into the areas of criminality, as if someone being from uh, one class or another or being one sex or another or something else is enough of a reason that she shouldn't face scrutiny. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years as cost of living pressures continue to ease. Inflation fell from 3.4 to 3.2 percent in March, meaning what we pay for goods and services is rising at a slower rate. The Office for National Statistics says food prices was one of the major contributing factors. Post Office boss Nick Reid has been cleared of bullying claims. In a statement, the Post Office said Mr Reid has been exonerated of all misconduct allegations following an independent review and would continue to lead the organisation. Concerns over the chief executive's behaviour were made public after former chairman Henry Staunton raised them to a select committee looking at the Horizon IT scandal. A mother of three who went missing last December died by drowning in the river where she was found, according to a coroner. Gaynor Lord failed to return home from her job in Norwich last year. Her body was eventually recovered from the River Wensum a week later. Police launched a major search operation in the wake of her disappearance. And people are being advised to stay away from Dubai Airport after the city was hit by the heaviest rainfall in 75 years. Check-in remains suspended for all Emirates flights today as the UAE is battered by torrential rain. Homes, cars, roads and runways were all inundated as five and a half inches fell in 24 hours yesterday, the equivalent of a year and a half of rain for the desert state. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello, it's still looking rather blustery out there for today and there will be some showers, particularly across eastern areas of the UK. As we see an area of low pressure slide its way southwards along the east coast, bringing some heavy and thundery showers. There's also an area of cloud and rain moving its way southwards from Northern Ireland, the Republic, to the far west of Wales and southwest England by the end of this afternoon. Everywhere else, there'll be some bright or sunny spells, but there's also going to be quite a few showers, as I mentioned, especially across the central and eastern areas of the UK, some of which will be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail and it's feeling cool with the northerly winds and the briskness of those winds as well temperatures only up to around 10 degrees celsius now overnight the showers will fade away southwards as will the rain across the southwest and it will be largely dry and clear winds will become lighter as well so it's going to be quite a chilly night and in rural spots there could be frosty conditions by dawn there will be cloud and rain from the next low moving to the northwest of the uk and that will continue to move its way southwards across scotland and northern ireland through tomorrow morning and then later towards the north of England and Wales there will be cloudier skies and patchy rain. Further south though looks mostly fine and bright and feeling milder with the lighter winds in the sunshine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including Lord Cameron's visit to Israel and calls to ban smacking in England and Northern Ireland. And we've been asking you, should smacking your children be made illegal? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text us, 8722, the number to do that. Write the word text before you mess... Text, talk. Text. Before you text. text. Or text... Oh, but... Talk, I don't know what's gone wrong talk, with me. Talk. I'm malfunctioning. Tweet us on X at Talk TV. I say right, that talk every day. I said that a million <laughs> times. And I just, today, no. Yeah. Can't or, do it. or you can uh, tweet us on X at Talk TV. And some of you have already been in touch. Yvonne has tweeted, me and my siblings were smacked a couple of times. It didn't do us any harm and taught us to respect our elders. None of us have mental issues and we are all in well-paying jobs. Justin says, I don't condone beating a child or smacking in anger, but in situations <coughs> that could be dangerous or with extreme negative behaviour, physical punishment is sometimes needed. Daisy writes, my dad used to give me a short, sharp smack to the back of the knees occasionally, as sometimes it was the only thing that would snap me out of my bratty tantrums. Personally, I think smacking is just fine in moderation. And Elise says, it's government overreach. The government should stay out of our lives. We discipline our child as we see fit. We would never hurt our children. I'm sick of governments meddling in our affairs. Well, let's get back to our top story. Greater Manchester Police has revealed it's investigating multiple allegations against Angela Rayner, which may extend beyond electoral law offences. The force says it's examining the Labour deputy's council and capital gains tax arrangements from when she lived between two different council houses in Stockport between 2007 and 2015. The investigation will likely take weeks rather than days, as Labour had hoped, and there are fears it will overshadow the upcoming local elections. Angela Rayner has denied any wrongdoing, insisting she followed the rules at all times. Joining us now in the studio is former Labour advisor Matthew Laza. Uh, well, you keep coming back about the same subject. I do. Yeah. Uh, but it does, it, <laughs> I predicted this last week and I'd be you back did, to the stage. You did. Uh, I mean, you know, on the face of it, it does get worse for her every day, but we must uh, uh, stress that she denies any wrongdoing. Uh, I think there's a case to say that the Manchester police, who originally said nothing to see here, no criminal uh, activity to be investigated, are somewhat maybe overcompensating uh, now. Suddenly there's 12 detectives yeah. on their case. <laughs> that seems like a lot. Uh, and I don't understand this line about she's not just being... Uh, investigated for electoral law. Well, she never was. It was yeah, always, I don't understand that it was either. Always electoral law and capital yeah. gains. Yeah, keeping the story alive. So I think that. I think the people who are most embarrassed about this are Greater Manchester Police, who yes. have gone from one extreme to the other. I mean, it's a force that is currently improving itself after years of uh, underperformance. And I speak as somebody from Greater Manchester, somebody in <laughs> fact, uh, uh, partly from Stockport. So um, the uh, I think as far as Angela's concerned, actually the overkill is uh, is actually the best result at the moment for her because we are now going to know one way or the other. It's not like they 
they're going to have a look and say, well, we didn't look at it properly. They're now yes, the 12 I, detectives I, I on the case. That, yeah. Nobody can say whatever they conclude mm. hasn't been looked at properly in depth uh, and, 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 and by proper uh, set of people. So Angela's been absolutely clear. She denies wrongdoing, as you say, but she's also been absolutely clear if she was to be convicted of any criminal offence, uh, then she would resign. And that's uh, a very clear commitment she's given. Now, she is obviously extremely confident that she's not going to do that uh, because um, uh, you wouldn't make that pledge... Well, you would, make, you, you would go before you were going to be pushed in, in other circumstances. So now, yes, OK, it may take a few weeks rather than a few days. I don't think it'll overshadow the local elections and we'll get the answers that I think people have the right to expect. I mean, could there be a risk here that whoever is responsible for the provenance of this story realises that there may be even more to come if you keep pulling on that thread? Because it does seem to me hugely overstaffed to throw 12 officers on this case. And, you know, d definitely when you see a story essentially being repeated as, oh, they're investigating her for something other than just uh, putting down the wrong address on her electoral register, um, you think, well, that was already in the... We already knew that. The, line. the other thing that everybody going on failed to notice in, is that, is that you, there's a one-year statute of limitations uh, on electoral registration offences, so you've only got one year from doing it. So I... that was... It's not only is she not being investigated... It, it, not only being investigated for that, she's not being investigated for that because you can't prosecute somebody it's, it's... even if she was swung after a year. So it's clearly on the tax situation, both yes. the council tax mm. and the capital gains the tax electoral, situation. The electoral registration thing is, right. is the, the more minor of the two Absolutely. allegations. And the key thing is it's not like she voted in two yeah. places or what. Or, or, or. Sometimes yeah. people end up in the electoral registration twice because when they move house, they forget to cross themselves off at the old address. Yeah. Uh, and well, the addresses are next to each other, the same constituency. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no allegations that there's any electoral fraud. It was just whether or not she was on the electoral register where she's twice when she should have been on once, even though she only used one of those registrations. Here's one for you, Matthew. Earlier in the show, uh, with her superior political knowledge, uh, Alex humiliated me because I said uh, that it was only the leaders of the party who had agreed to publish their tax returns. Uh, it isn't. The Labour Party pledged to publish the tax returns of the leader, the deputy leader and the uh, de uh, shadow chancellor. Uh, so why uh, has she steadfastly refused uh, to go along with Labour policy? Because this is not her tax return, because remember this is from 2015, so what they pledged to do is every year to publish the tax returns, which they have done for the three leading figures. That's a good point. This is, uh, this is from 2015, it's before she's an MP, and of course it wouldn't have featured on her tax return because she didn't pay cap, there's no dispute that she didn't pay capital gains tax. Uh. The question is whether she should have paid capital gains tax. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, right. um, uh, even if you saw the tax return, What's it wouldn't tax? be on there. That's part of the point. Yeah, exactly. Good point, good point. Oh. Well, let's speak now to former Met Police Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville. Mike, 12 officers on this case now investigating which address Rayner was living in during this period of time. Is that a huge overkill or is there more that they might be looking at that requires all of those resources? Well, I, I agree. It's an enormous amount of officers. Some murder inquiries would have uh, 12 uh, officers on them. <laughs> and there's some simple things that could be done here. The Labour Party could produce the document where she uh, applied to be an MP. I mean, if they're looking at things like, uh, did she claim single person's allowance uh, when it was a council tax and there'd be a few thousand pounds worth of uh, fraud there? Uh, are they going to look at uh, that? Uh, what, when she uh, sold the house, how much did she, did she pay anything in tax? But these are really... Uh, the police have trained financial investigators and one of those officers could really make all those inquiries. So why there's uh, 12 officers? Because that sounds like there's probably a detective inspector, a, a couple of detective sergeants and, and detective constables who may well be better employed uh, investigating uh, burglaries, robberies and rapes. Uh, I would think, Mike, that uh, if she has done wrong... Uh, uh, and she's found it. She, she, she's got a lot of stuff to worry about right now uh, with 12 officers investigating. And, I mean, it's just pure speculation, but it does sound to me as if there might be more than what we know. Uh, Stephen Watson, the Greater Manchester Police Chief, uh, he said, uh, in terms of Angela Rayner, there are a... And this is a quote, a number of assertions knocking about. <laughs> uh, so, so that could be more than just what we know so far, right, with 12 officers involved. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Steve Watson's one of the best chief constables. He's really turned Greater Manchester around. So I don't imagine he would uh, waste uh, officers' time on, on that. But what what is it that we know? We know very little at the moment. As has been indicated, this uh, idea that the, uh, you can be prosecuted for electoral offences under the representation of the People's Act, that's 12 months, so that's gone. You're talking about uh, potential frauds, two potential frauds, 
and uh, some sort of tax evasion. I think, but I think what the public will be concerned with the greatest offence that a, a politician can commit, of course, is hypocrisy. Uh, and here we have somebody who's demanded to see uh, a, a Tory MP's tax return and won't show hers. Uh, who, de who demanded that Boris resign because he's under a criminal investigation and she hasn't uh, resigned. So, all, and, and, and tells other people they can't buy a council house and buys hers. And, and I think to the public, that is the greater uh, offence of all these. What I don't understand is this mystery advice that she supposedly got, uh, which is in some sort of letter saying you've done nothing wrong, which if she'd done nothing wrong, we could have seen it, the police could have seen it, Sir Keir Starmer himself could have seen it, and this matter would all be cleared up. This is what I don't understand about the situation, which suggests to me that she probably has done something wrong. Well, I, I absolutely agree. And as I said before, there's that document, you see this letter, this tax advice, and it's very amusing, isn't it, to see a Labour MP who usually, they usually say tax avoidance is the same as tax evasion. No, this has all changed. Uh, and there's also, as I said, the letter or the application form for, to the Labour Party to say where she was living. You've also got her aides saying one thing, the local neighbours saying another. So these things need to be uh, uh, cleared up. But as you've said, some of these things could be easily sorted and they're not doing them, which and people don't like evasion and, and uh, potential lies. Uh, Mike, you said uh, Stephen Watson is uh, uh, one of the best chief constables, uh, and from what I've seen of him, I agree. He's the guy who said, right, from now on, we're going to investigate every burglary, every bike theft, everything. Uh, I think that's a great move on his part. But I do think he's got some questions to uh, answer. Uh, when this issue orig originally arose, I think it was the Mail on Sunday or something revealed it, the, that she was accused, stood accused of uh, um, evading capital gains tax and not uh, registering herself properly electorally. Uh, the Magister Police looked into it and announced there's nothing to see here, no criminal investigation is required. Then a Tory MP called James Daly uh, went back to the police and said, are you sure about this? I think it does require investigation. Guess what? Uh, Magister Police did a big U-turn and said, yeah, you're quite right, we better have a look at this. Now they've got 12 detectives on it. <laughs> so uh, why uh, would they have made that decision in the first place that there was nothing criminal here? Uh, there's a problem here, isn't there? Well, I'm well, I imagine it was a, quite a junior officer, you know, sort of a detective inspector who made that initial decision. And as, as we've indicated, you know, one of the crimes she's accused of, she can't be prosecuted for because it's more than, it's a long time. It's not, it's certainly more than 12 months ago. So somebody probably made that decision without thinking, you know, strategically, this is a really national, national issue with real interest. So whilst we're only talking about a, a few tens of thousands of pounds, possibly, it's the fact it's the deputy leader of the Labour Party. So Steve Watson wouldn't have been involved in that initial decision but of course once it blew up he would have uh, him and his command team would have had to make uh, that to change this and, and give guidance that they're going to do this but i still do think that 12 officers is a really a lot of officers for well, what would seemingly be a financial inquiry by the way mate it's at least 12 officers well, yeah. it could be and more you think with that many officers uh, if you've got 12 people working on this then the whole thing should be done and dusted in a week but they're saying this could go on for weeks and weeks i mean that seems mad yeah, I'm with you, actually. So I, I don't, I cannot comprehend how you can employ 12 officers for a week on a case where you say, right, show me this letter, show me this application form, show me your tax return for that year. How, how many officers does it uh, take uh, to do that? We understand it's a sense of inquiry, so there's probably an a, a experienced DI on it, but the rest, I, I, I don't comprehend. Two people, I, I would have thought, unless they've uncovered some... Uh, I don't know, wicked uh, crime empire that should, you know, it would seem to be nonsense. <laughs> but that um, so, uh, I mean, coppers, uh, I mean, in the past have had a bit of a reputation sometimes for, shall we say, getting over-enthusiastic about n nabbing a, a celebrity victim, you know, a celebrity uh, 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 suspect. Uh, I would imagine that in this circumstance, Stephen Watson, the police chief in Manchester, will be all over the officers making sure that this investigation is scrupulously fair. Would I be right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So in the police, you have the you know the bronze, silver, gold issue. So the uh, the bronze will probably be some kind of a, a the, maybe the DCI, the DI, uh, the bronze. Uh, they're the guys, the worker, the workers who go and do it. But there'll be a gold commander who will be a assistant chief constable rank who will be overseeing this because, as you say, this is something that is front page news. It's the top of your news hour story, and so the, and the Manchester police will be all over that. If you look at the police. In the past with some of the uh, press failings we saw in Lancashire in particular, uh, they will not want to repeat that. They'll want to get it uh, right now. So as I say, the, every day there'll be a gold meeting where the uh, latest developments are discussed. Uh, so there isn't any real cock-ups. That was that were the gold commander's aim. Mike, thank you ever Thanks, so much. Mike. Mike Neville, former police officer there. Now, Matthew, if uh, they do uncover a crime <laughs> empire after their... <laughs> I think we all think that's a very unlikely. I think we should stress. If they do. Yes. We, that's that very, very, very unlikely. unlikely. Very unlikely. I think oh, Mike no. had his tongue in his cheek there. <laughs> I don't know. Four six is going to be boring lately. I wouldn't mind <laughs> it. Um, but if, if, if she does have to step down yeah. and resign as deputy leader... Who are the people most likely to take her position? One name that's been touted. You said Bridget Phillips. I did, yeah, time. absolutely. Someone that we can couldn't pick out of a lineup, but I looked at her online. She seems to be part of the Lego factory of, um, you know, sort of uh, yeah. funny hairstyles, yeah, funny yeah. bobs. <laughs> she's got, she's got, she's got the TV bob, which she's I'm got glad to see. Bob, you know, yeah, she's yeah, got yeah, the, the Rachel Reeves, the Rachel Reeves bob. bob. Yeah. Um, but another name that's been thrown into the ring apparently is John Ashworth, uh, who I used to share a flat with. Uh, did you? I did, yeah. I've known, I've known uh, uh, John since I ran Young Labour, and he was just finishing school, and um, uh, was very active in Young Labour. I mean, John would be a great deputy leader, as would Bridget. I think, I mean, John is. Is from uh, is actually from Greater Manchester, although he's an MP in Leicester, so he'd have the out of London thing because you Keir Starmer obviously a London MP. Mm. You can't have two London MPs um, as the leader and the deputy leader. You need a bit of regional uh, a balance. Um, so West Streeting, who would be a natural name to chuck in, uh, who is an MP in East London, uh, would put that probably rules West out. I would have thought that um, uh, that there's uh, be quite a lot of pressure to have a woman. Yeah, a woman. Um, yeah, uh, sure. So that would me to take you more towards Bridget uh, than it would towards uh, uh, John. But I mean, um, you know. Uh, uh, it'd be quite nice. You know, you're getting old when your former flatmates uh, have been talked about <laughs> to be deputy leader of the Labour Party. John's, one of, I mean, one of the roles of the deputy leader is to be the kind of attack dog um, um, and uh, the sort of take on the Tories to be the minister for the, the shadow minister for today programme, as it were. And that's one of John's jobs at the moment mm. in the shadow cabinet. So that's, I think, why his name's been mentioned. So he's a possible. But I'd still put and would, money she, on would it be a big loss to lose Angela Rayner? Because this is what well, we were debating be, in the first yeah. half of the programme. Because James Price, our earlier guest, mm. said, "Well, actually, for the Tories, it's quite useful. She sticks around. She's not popular." Isabel Oakeshott said, "No, I think she's I incredibly yeah. popular." She's, I don't agree with James. I think, she's, I think she's, she's very popular well. amongst uh, 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 working class women, amongst lower income women voters in particular, who who really feel that there's somebody who speaks to them, who uh, isn't yet another Oxbridge educator. I'm not one special advisor. I plead guilty on, on that front. So. She, I think she has a unique appeal in politics, and I think she brings something to the table because you want somebody who has been a worker on the minimum wage. Authentic. Is, is a care worker. She's authentic. She is what she is, and she doesn't pretend to be anything otherwise. If you remember when she was taken to the posh opera at Glyndebourne uh, and some of the Tory papers, in fact, I think some Tory politicians tried to uh, criticise her for that, and she was up front. She said, What's wrong? What, you know, now it's too good for the workers, effectively, yeah. is what she was mm -hmm. saying. And I think she has an honesty and an authenticity, I, I which is a really that, valuable voice around the table. She does sort of somehow, by her very existence, expose some of those dinosaur attitudes of some of the conservative, you know, old, old guard. Do you remember when Nadine Doris said, you know, that about Cameron and Osborne, these were posh boys who didn't know uh, at the cost of a, a pint of milk? Yeah. Mm. Um, well, certainly, you know, um, uh, Angela is the absolute antidote to that. Yeah. And in a sense, so she does bring something around the table. So I think, I mean, I, I think everybody in the Labour Party, I was speaking to Keir's team uh, at the weekend about Angela as the stories came out, and I think everybody's very keen that she stays. Uh, Keir's today was out fighting at Prime Minister's questions, yeah. criticising... He's, Chris, he's, Chris, he's, he's fighting for a summer. So much he's absolutely almost considering looking at her tax uh, <laughs> advice. I think oh, now he's leaving that to Greater Manchester Police. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, I mean, you know, what are the, otherwise, what are these 12 detectives going to do with kids? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, you know, who knows if she does survive uh, this uh, uh, saga and is found innocent, she could go on to make history and the Labour Party could actually think about having a woman as a leader. Well, well I hope Keir's going to be the Prime Minister. Yeah, could, I, I well, a woman, could, though. A woman.
alone as a leader. Do you think that's a concept the Labour Party ever could well, embrace? It, it is. Look, I, 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 as I said before, I don't understand why uh, Labour has such problems with electing women as I leader. Um, I find it extraordinary that when we just elected a new leader in Wales just a few uh, weeks ago that we didn't even have a female candidate. Uh, uh, no, it was just it was two blokes um, uh, who had uh, who both had it, one was black and one was gay. And so uh, Vaughan is a great guy and he's the first black first minister of Wales. But I think it would be nice that it, a woman had been that. And remember, in Wales, we've had 50-50 in the Welsh uh, Parliament, now the Senate, yeah. right from the beginning. Mm. So, for, right from the beginning. So, what I want to know is um, why, if we've got 50-50, as it were, at the at, at sort of, you know, a bronze, as it were, um, to, to use Mike's uh, dis police description of it, why, when it comes to silver and gold, um, uh, women don't always make their way through? So, that's actually something that I think is really should be addressed. I mean, if I was if I was Keir, I'd ask uh, Harriet Harman um, to have a look at that, because Harriet did so much work on getting more women into Parliament. I thought you were going to her through. as a leader. I think... Uh, I uh, love Harriet. I think her ship Harriet, has sailed. Yes, yeah, ha Harriet's now... Into we, retirement, we, a well deserved retirement. We desperately need more diversity in our politics. If you look at all the leaders of, um, you know, whether it's the London Mayor, Wales, there's no white women. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Where are the there, white well, women? There are no women of any of this That's the issue. And the debates, of course, um, uh, the debates, um, uh, you're going to see not one of the main uh, political parties, the Greens have a joint uh, yeah. one man, one woman leader. Right. But apart from that, it's all, uh, it's all blokes. It's going to be Matthew, very boring. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Always a pleasure to see you. See you on the next uh, Angela Rayner. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> now, coming up after the break, senior doctors urge the government to ban smacking children in England and Northern Ireland. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oh, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now a group of senior doctors want the government to ban parents from smacking their children in England and Northern Ireland. Well, it's already illegal in Scotland and Wales, but now the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health believes this should be extended across the whole of the UK, claiming smacking can lead to mental health problems and violent outbursts in adulthood. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at you there. <laughs> Joining us to discuss this, Graham Nichols, director of Affinity Gospel Churches, who is against a ban, and psychologist and writer Wendy Gregory, who is in favour of a ban. Uh, I'm actually going to start with you, Wendy. Why, uh, why do you think this ban needs to be in place when we already have legislation that prevents child abuse or injuring a child, that sort of thing? And parents out there would think, well, you know, sometimes if I have to resort to a tap, it might be necessary. Okay, so I think there's been a very grey area, there still is, for a long time around the hitting of children. And currently, as you've just said, the law is that you can't physically injure a child. But, you know, where is that? Where is that line drawn? And we all lose our tempers, of course we do, occasionally. What if you really lost it and you didn't really quite know where to stop? I think by having that ban, it's just very, very clear. You cannot hit children. Plus, I don't see any reason why anybody needs to hit a child. They're smaller than you, you have all the power, you're the grown up, you're the big person. Why on earth do you need to hit a child? And I'm, I'm the first person to agree that children need to be disciplined, they need to be taught boundaries, they need to learn rules and respect. But there are many, many other ways to do that that don't involve hurting them. Uh, let's go to you now, Graham. Uh... You know, I've been saying this all day. I'm of a certain age. Uh, during my childhood, every kid expected to be hit by adults on a daily basis. I was hit by my mum, my dad, uh, the local copper, teachers. Uh, I was regularly smacked, but I was never beaten. I was never injured. Uh, so, whereas, of course, I agree with... We don't want p parents going round beating their kids or hitting their kids willy-nilly. Now and again, surely parents should be able to make their own decisions about how they discipline their kids. If, for example, a kid's running towards a motorway, you might want to emphasise, please don't do that again. I'm just saying, I don't think it's for the government or the police to tell parents how to rear their kids. Yeah, um, I think I'm of a similar age to you, but I don't think I've been hit quite as many times. So <laughs> I obviously was much better behaved as a child. <laughs> but I don't think it's for the government to interfere where there's not actual clear evidence of harm. I, I think the law as it stands is actually very reasonable because it talks about um, reasonable chastisement. So uh, all, the, all the checks of losing your temper and doing something that's unreasonable is already there. I don't particularly think smacking is, is always that effective. I think it is in some cases for some short periods of time in young children does have an effect. But I think it's more the principle that if you're not actually uh, chastising your children in order to harm them and it's not done with malice uh, and, and intent to, to hurt or to harm, I think children, parents should have the freedom to be able to bring up their children in the way that they think is best. And I think it's part of a bigger picture of the state assuming that it knows best in lots of areas. Uh, and I don't think it will make any difference to genuine harm to children that will happen by people who are violent with their children and abusive. And I think, I agree, a, that's Graham. covered by I the agree law, and you. I don't think the law will make any difference. Yeah, Wendy, that, that was a point I was going to make. Those who likely beat their children do so anyway, regardless of that being illegal. My worry about this and the enforcement of this, if this were to become law in this country, would be giving a green light to a bit of a snooper's charter again, you know, people sort of dobbing other people in and maybe misinterpreting a situation at what point if a child is running around a supermarket and pulling things off supermarket shelves and having a hissy fit and screaming and a, a parent needs to physically restrain them, at what, what point does that sort of cross into, well, was that a smack, was that an apprehension? Okay. I think it sort of creates yeah. a very difficult circumstance. Well, it does, but reasonable restraint is, is one thing. I mean, the police are allowed to reasonably restrain people. They're not just allowed to hit them willy-nilly. <laughs> so if, if, you know, these laws are in place for, for adults. Why, why not put it in place for parents? It's, um, and I just would have to question what was said about uh, not deliberately hurting your children. 
Smacking is deliberately hurting your children. The point of a smack is it hurts. So, you know, I would have to challenge that. But I still think, yes, you can't stop anything totally. If somebody's determined, if someone's determined to commit murder, then that's what they're going to do. You know, having the law there doesn't really make a difference. But it might and hopefully it will make more people think about it. And I'm, you know, I'm not Miss Goody Two Shoes. I'm going to put my hand up and say, I smacked my children when they were small. This was before I trained as a psychologist. I'm not proud of it. I'm actually quite ashamed of it. And now I realise that it wasn't necessary. And I wish that I hadn't done it because I taught my children how to lose their tempers. Right. Wendy, this is, this is what worries me about this. I mean, it, it's a law. If they bring this law in, it, it, so it's on the assumption that there's all these parents all over the country, you know, just smacking the hell out of their kids. And if we don't have a law, you know, kids will be badly injured. That is absolute nonsense. Uh, and, and, you know, as I say, you know, of course, no, nobody says, oh, it's great to smack your kids all the time. But now and again, I think parents should have the right to make that decision about what they do with their own children. And do you really want to live in a country where if I see some woman or something smacking their kid, report them to the police, or even a child reports their parents to the police, the cops come round and arrest those parents. Is that what you want? Not necessarily, no, but that's not really what I'm well, saying. that's what will happen if we have this law. But is it what will happen? Yes, it is. I mean, I think, you know, I think people yes, it is. What's the point of the law if the police don't come round and arrest you, if you break that law? OK, so can I give another example um, here? It's a slightly different thing, but uh, men are not allowed to beat their wives. OK, that's called abuse. If a woman reports it, the police will say to her, what do you wish us to do? Do you want us to arrest him now because we can? Or would you prefer us to go and talk to him? But obviously, I've seen Henry hasn't actually put her in hospital. Different yeah, but that, that's a different... That's different. That's different. That's adults. Uh, if you smack a kid, that's a different thing. The police can't say to the kid, what would you like us to do? That's a no, minor. But they can go around and, no, they can go around and talk to the parents. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to arrest Oh, so you want a system where people, the cops just talk to people? That's not how you administer they the law. Do. Well, they already do. I'm afraid I have to disagree. <laughs> well, you can't. It isn't the police's job to go around and talk to people. If somebody reports someone who smacks their kids, uh, the police would have, if it's against the law, the police would have to go around. And if they establish that the kid had been smacked, that's against the law. That parent gets arrested. That is not that's a pretty a sight. Story, I'm going to say you were wrong. They don't necessarily arrest them at all. A bit like What's when the they point of the law, them. then? What's the point Smoking of Smoking weed. They don't necessarily arrest them. They give them a chance. They talk to them. They, they, it's still I the don't law. Think you, they you, can't Wendy, you're obviously power. a law-abiding citizen. You've never been in trouble with the police. This isn't how, how they act. Uh, let's bring Graham back in. Uh, your thoughts? Um, just to make clear, when I talked about hurt and harm, mm. it was to do with intent. When a parent smacks a child, they're not intending to hurt. Of course, they're intending to have a, a moment of pain, which uh, you know abruptly kind of might bring to end the behaviour or might remind the, the child that they're not to do that behaviour. But it's, it's to do with intent. Uh, it's completely different with a domestic abuse situation where it is uh, you know, done in a rage and it is done to hurt and to harm. Yeah, that, yeah, and I'm not so much advocating for is, is smacking you know, the, a brilliant way of discipline. Uh, it's more about the rights of parents to parent. Totally. And I don't think this crosses a barrier into hurt or harm uh, that the state should interfere with. Of course, if there's abuse going on, the state has a role of actually stepping in. But I think there's lots of areas where, I mean, transgender is, is a great example that's, that's crept over the last decade, where the state or schools make decisions over and above parents. Yeah. And I think it's part of that bigger piece. Yeah, I don't like that yeah. either. But I think mums and dads should bring up I kids, not the state. I just think as well, you know, if, you, if you're a child and you said, I've been, you know, injured by a parent, then you've got bruises to show the police. If you're a particularly naughty teen or whatever, then you could phone up the police, dob your parents in when they've not laid a finger on you. And where's the evidence? I just yeah. think it could be used... Uh, Quite inappropriate. I'll tell you, when I was a kid, if this law was around, I'd have dobbed my parents in for a laugh. Yeah, I bet you would have done. <laughs> there's, there's so many problems. Wendy, uh, sorry to give you a hard time, no. but you know what I mean. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you, Graham. Well, we've been asking you, should smacking your children be made illegal? And Phyllis from Bolton is on the line. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, do you think that this is huge government overreach and potentially going to create a bit of a minefield? Or is it about time we I said, well, what is this I, doing well, to kids? I, I come at this from a different point of view. I'm very old. I'm in my 80s. Um, and when I was brought up in the 40s and 50s, 
smacking your child was quite normal. Yeah. <laughs> However, I was never smacked. Not ever. When I'd done something naughty, I was sat down, I was talked to, I was told how disappointed my parents were in me, how I'd not been brought up to behave like that, and then it would go on for maybe a couple of hours every time I looked. Disappointment would be writ large on their faces, and I would have to get back into good books, and I prayed for a quick smack on the bottom, like everybody else got. A quick smack, and it's over. Because... The old saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, but calling doesn't hurt you, is not true. I mean, is it not the case, Phyllis, that when it comes to, without sort of, you know, downgrading children to a subspecies, pets and children don't necessarily understand rationality. They don't understand an adult saying, this is why you mustn't do this because X, Y and Z. And, and some children are just prone it's... to having temper tantrums and need to be told in an instant, stop it! Yeah. I, I think it's beyond that. I think, as uh, not in my case, uh, in, for me, it made me always want to please people and not to be horrible to anybody and um, never, ever to try to... And really, when I should have been more forceful. Um, and I do think that if you look at the animals, the, mum, the mummy tiger will give her little one a quick whiff round yeah. the head and, and yeah. then that's fine. Um, and I think... It, that, for me, would have been infinitely yeah. preferable, mm. you know, to... Because things but stay Phyllis, in your don't mind. You think, don't you think it comes down to this? You, you, you said that w during your childhood you were sat down and talked to rather than being smacked. That was your parents' decision. Uh, but don't you think that all of this is up to mums and dads, what they do? I mean, and that is not to encourage beating, but the odd clip round the ear, if that's what parents want to do, surely that's got nothing to do with the government or, or the police. We're talking about something quite different from a quick smack to a beating. Mm. Yeah, but, um, but it, a quick smack. This is what's being proposed, that this becomes illegal and you'll get arrested for it. I think that's uh, uh, very sinister. Well, you have to go with the flow of what's happened in the world I later became a teacher, and in fact, I did over 40 years in schools. And when I've watched the way that behaviour has degenerated in schools, when I started teaching, I could smack. And in fact, I began my teaching career in a secondary modern school for all boys, and I was 21 years old. <laughs> and it was perfect. It was perfect. All the men on the staff had either been in the war or they'd done national service, and they knew how to handle the boys. Mm. And there was corporal punishment. And if anybody even looked at me wrong, I would just say to them, do you want to go and see Mr Burton? And that would have meant the cane. Yeah. And the whole class shut up. So, uh, going for a Burton, know, always a bad thing, going Phyllis. For Burton. Uh, Phyllis, uh, great to talk to you. Thank, Thank you very yes. much for the call. Really good call. Yeah. Uh, moving on now, and Lord Cameron has confirmed that Israel will strike back against Iran. The Foreign Secretary made the comments in Israel, where he's currently meeting with senior officials, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. Well, joining us now is former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth. Sir Gerald, I mean, the, the mood music coming out of both Number 10 and Cameron and across the pond has been saying to Israel, oh, you know, be careful. You're know, being tough is sometimes turning the other cheek. And Israel saying, well, look, come on. If you had been a country with 300 odd warheads about to rain down on you, uh, would you want to turn the other cheek? But it is interesting that actually is, uh, Iran has turned around and said, well, if Israel so much as lifts one thing in retaliation, which according to David Cameron, they are going to do, that they're going to magic up a weapon, the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. Now, if you were Cameron, what would you be saying? Well, good afternoon, uh, Kevin. Alex, if I could just say, uh, Kevin, I entirely agree with everything you said about the previous conversation. It's the responsibility of parents to bring up their children, not the state. I knew you'd agree. Uh, and parent, <laughs> parents should decide on these matters. No, yeah, I got yeah. chased around by, the, with my, by my mother with the, the stair brush and by the time I could outrun her, that's when she could no longer beat me up and I got caned at school and, frankly, it hasn't done me any harm. <laughs> However, to, that's by the by, but to address me the too, point... Me too, me too, Joe. I, I went through all that as well. Talking about uh, physical punishment, <laughs> should Israel be deploying the same sort of mentality <laughs> yeah. against well, yes. Iran? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I think the Mad Mullahs could do with a bit of the stair brush, personally. Um, but it might need something rather more uh, drastic than the stairbrush. The fact is that uh, Iran has 
uh, has pursued a war against uh, Israel, which they wish to drive into the Mediterranean Sea. That is their policy for the last uh, 30 years. And they have done it through proxies, through Hezbollah in Lebanon, through Hamas in Gaza, and through the Houthis in Yemen. And they've paid them something like 16 billion pounds over the last 15 years uh, to um, attack the Israelis uh, on their behalf. So what the Israelis did, uh, it would appear that they attacked that consulate and took out the uh, senior uh, military commanders in Damascus. Uh, maybe it was done in order to specifically to provoke Iran. And Iran, as you rightly say, launched a massive attack upon Israel in excess of 300 uh, missiles, including 30 large cruise missiles, which could have killed a lot of people and done a huge amount of damage. Uh, but only thanks to the the air defenses which uh, which Israel has and the immediate spontaneous support of its principal allies, Britain, the United States and France and Jordan, came to their assistance. And I think that it does behove the Israelis to think uh, about the views of their of their allies, because we did come to their support. They have not come to the support of Ukraine, as we requested that they should do. And interestingly, Ben Wallace, the former Secretary of State for Defense, uh, said in the Telegraph yesterday, he said that in his experience, the only way to deal with a bully is to smack him hard. And I share that view. However, I do think the Israelis got to think very, very carefully about how they respond to what happened on Saturday night. There is a very real risk this could escalate, and that would not just draw in Israel. It would draw in Israel's allies and friends as well, as well as the wider Arab world. So they have got to think very carefully if they can come up with a strike which indicates the extent to which they can defeat Iran, because let us face it, Iran's attack on Israel was a complete, utter failure on Saturday. Over 300 weapons and only about five actually got through. So it was a, it was a, a gross failure. But if, uh, if Israel can devise with their sophisticated precision uh, weapons a response, then uh, I think that that would work. But uh, they have got to be very, very careful indeed. And they cannot just ignore their friends because they do rely upon their friends. And you know, Netanyahu faces quite a lot of opposition at home. Some say that had he uh, been more awake on the watch, uh, the initial attack by Hamas, the brutal murder of so many Israelis, would not have happened if their intelligence had been more Sorry to speed. interrupt, Gerald. I just want to ask you something. Uh, I, I yes, mean, I, I think I think it was always fanciful uh, for various world leaders, uh, including ours, to say, "Oh, don't respond, Israel. Uh, you know, show restraint." Uh, how would they like it if 300 missiles? poured down on London or Paris or Washington. Of course they'd respond. Of course Israel was always going to respond. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to ask you is, what do you think the nature of that retaliation will be? Uh, because I think the wise thing would be to look into Iran's nuclear capabilities, their nuclear projects, and attack that. Well, I think that's a very interesting idea. I, I think it would be extremely provocative because what we do know is that Iran is doing all it can to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, there was a, uh, a plan uh, uh, which was uh, undertaken by the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, that is to say the United Kingdom, United States, France, Russia and China. It's called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was drawn up in 2015. And under that, uh, there was a kind of arrangement under which Iran would be uh, given better access to the civilized world um, on the condition that they did not use their, their uranium in order to uh, facilitate the building of nuclear weapons. Uh, um, Donald Trump, in my view, entirely correctly withdrew the United States from that agreement. I think it was fanciful uh, from the outset. But I, as I repeat my point, I think they've got to be, the Australians have got to be very careful. And, and that's why you haven't seen any retaliation no. uh, as <laughs> yet, because yeah. they are really trying to work out how they can do it, how they can do some kind of precision strike, mm -hmm. which will not result in Iran uh, trying uh, further aggression directly on Israel rather than through its proxies. Very, very difficult for them. We have to be uh, uh, supportive of Israel. But if I just add this one point, I think mm. the Israelis should stop occupying other people's land.
the West Bank is not part of Israel, mm. and the behavior of the settlers has done nothing to assist well, Israel. There are so, so many Iran. complicated things going on in the Middle East. Well, let's all hope and pray that Iran isn't a week away from creating a nuclear warhead and it all kicks off. Uh, Gerald, thank you ever so much Always for coming back. Always a pleasure, Gerald. Thank you very show. much. Speaking much sense there. My pleasure. Now, coming up after the break, inflation falls, but not as much as economists predicted. So what does that mean for your finances? We'll be finding out shortly. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, inflation has fallen again, dropping to 3.4% at the end of March. The fall was less than expected, meaning the Bank of England could hold off on cutting interest rates until later this year. Joining us now is economist Justin Urquhart-Stewart. Uh, Justin, uh, two questions, really. You shouldn't really ask two questions at once, but I'm going to... <laughs> D uh, rules were okay. made to be rules were made to be broken. <laughs> First of all, uh, since inflation has plummeted by three point four four percent or to three point four percent, why is that not being reflected in prices? Everything still seems to be sky high. And secondly, uh, why won't the Bank of England cut interest rates? OK. Oh, first of all, what you've got is confusion at the moment because you've got inflation, which is obviously prices going up. Then you have this strange thing called disinflation, which is still inflation, but at a lower level. And that's what we're in now. And then you've got deflation, where actually the economy is actually shrinking overall. 
Deinflation, you really don't want to be in at all because that's very difficult. But disinflation is still inflation, but a lower level. We want to bring that down to 2%. Now, why is that always being reflected in what we're seeing with prices? Well, it, it does reflect actually a small uh, rises in various areas, but things like food and those sort of areas, they could be affected by the price of sterling. And bear in mind, we were actually import most of our food. The week of sterling, it's going to cost us more. So you can see how that gets fed through. Then subsequent to that, then the interest rate interest levels, as we discussed before, should not have gone up in the first place um, because interest rates, uh, putting those up, are there to try and uh, put people off when there's a consumer boom. Well, as far as I know, in the past few years, we haven't had a consumer boom, diametrically the opposite. So what you saw was actually the bank deliberately thinking to try and slow the economy down at a time actually where we wanted to increase the speed of the economy, um, but try and control inflation. But as far as the prime minister is concerned, he promised lower inflation. He can't do that because the price of oil and others, others are outside his control. And so we also had the issues following the banking crisis of the, of the supply of goods. And that was the area that was causing real inflation coming through when you get the odd boat stuck in the Suez Canal, a couple of wars going on and uh, some trade disputes. All of that added together means that actually we've got uh, lower inflation, but the outlook over, over the next few months may not be as positive as some people are seeing. Yeah, so let's not pop the champagne corks yet. Of all the instability in the world, we could finally end up once again in an energy crisis again next winter, with cargo not getting through the Suez Canal or the Red Sea, and we'll all be in a pickle once more. Yes, yeah, well, jolly good. In which case, go and buy a case of scotch and go and sit in a cave in Wales. Um, <laughs> the, the global economy is still growing, despite it. When you think about what's happening, we had banking crisis, we had COVID few wars going on, supply chain issues, um, and therefore you would think, well, actually, we're heading for disaster. We're having a slowdown in the American economy, but it is still growing, but at a slower rate. We're further behind on that. Um, but uh, as we discussed before, certainly the interest rates should come down because, frankly, we had them at emergency level rates since the banking crisis. So many people who were taking out uh, mortgages over the past few years thought that 1% or 2% was the norm. No, the norm was about 4 or 5%. Um, and therefore, you sort of suckered people into taking mortgages, which, when those rates returned to a normal level, was really painful. They haven't gone up a bit. Some of them have doubled in terms of their interest costs. And that's very, very painful, particularly for uh, those people who are uh, working for themselves, self-employed, small businesses, which is the largest part of our economy, not big companies like the petrol companies and things like that. It's smaller businesses going out and having the courage to be able to start a business and often investing their own money in it, mm. they're the people we need to try and provide help for, not giveaways, but a sensible taxation service, which actually makes sure you're encouraged to actually have more investment coming in domestically and overseas and make it locally as well, not just UK coming out of uh, Bank of England. Perfect. Uh, really good timing, Justin. Perfect thank timing. you so much. Excellent <laughs> thank work. You, Justin. Sadly, uh, we've come to the end of the show, Alex. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Up next is Ian Collins. Have a good afternoon. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> if this helps weather people, I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs>I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite yay. right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs>